Hey everyone! Today I'm proud to tell you I did not write this video myself. I sometimes ask people if they want to make a video for this channel, not with me, instead of me. Uh, but this friend was a little shy about appearing in front of a camera, so I'll be reading this one as usual. All references are in the description. Oh, one other thing before I begin. I'm working on a video about Squid Game, you know, like everyone else, so that should be out in the next few days. If it's been a few days already, you can find it on this playlist. Shall we begin? Hi everyone, my name is... well, never mind what their name is. And I'm here to talk about social programs. Social programs are organized efforts by a society to try and provide things for its populace, usually through governmental means in our current society. You may have heard of some examples before, such as the NHS or National Health Service in the UK, or Social Security in the US. If you're not familiar with these, that's okay, because I'll be more extensively covering them and a bunch of examples. To establish a definition for a means-tested social program, we must also identify the alternative. There are two common types of social programs in our society. Those that are universal, such as the NHS, and those that are means-tested, like Social Security. Universal programs are available to everyone, while means-tested programs have several conditions that must be met for someone to benefit from the program. For example, I'm going to give out stickers. However, I don't want to give stickers to people with too much money because they can just buy their own. As a means of excluding those who can already buy stickers, I have to create an application process or some other filtering process to identify who actually deserves or needs my stickers. It gets much more complicated than this, but that's the basic premise. Means-tested programs are popular among politicians across the institutional political spectrum, including liberals, conservatives, and even social democrats. This phenomenon is less widely recognized or discussed among the general populace, and it isn't often given a name when it is. You may be confused as to why anarchists such as myself would be concerned with social programs or the mechanisms of modern government. While this isn't a video meant to dispel misconceptions about anarchism, I very briefly want to clarify anarchism is misunderstood by many people to imply the absence of all societal organization and the further atomization of the individual who has to fend for themselves and possibly work with other small groups of people to survive. This deeply misguided idea, largely spread by media portrayals of anarchy and joke ideologies like anarcho-capitalism, is an idea not embraced by any serious anarchist. Anarchists absolutely want to abolish the state and its oppressive institutions, but one of the many reasons for this is because we believe horizontal organizations and democratic processes can better provide for the needs of the people. Anarchist societies, both temporary and enduring, have embraced the idea of social welfare and universal programs. But more importantly to today's video, understanding means testing will give you a better idea of the flaws of our current capitalist welfare system and how it can be improved, even if a broader social transformation is not yet in the cards. There are many means-tested programs utilized by countries across the globe, and they all share the same core problems, although sometimes to different extents. I'm from the US, where means testing is rampant and normalized in all aspects of our society, so my personal examples and experiences will be largely based on such. One area of means testing that I've been very familiar with is applying for financial aid to go to university, which is very, very expensive in the US. I grew up incredibly poor with my parents buried under mountains of debt and only able to hold on because of government assistance. Because of this, I wouldn't possibly be able to afford a, a post-secondary education without some form of financial aid from the government or from the university that I was attending. To receive this aid, though, I had to apply for it every single year through both the federal government and my state government. 
These applications require an astronomical amount of personal information, such as you and your family's demographic information, the work history, income, and assets of everyone in your family, all of your documentation as a citizen or other lawful resident, and pretty much everything else you can imagine. Multiple times, these applications wouldn't be enough. And I would get audited by my university to provide even more information and to verify the information that I already provided. All of this was to receive a modest bit of money aid that would change from year to year, but not what you would expect for someone as poor as myself attending a state-subsidized university. I was still left with thousands upon thousands of dollars of, of, of debt to foot the bill for, which left me with few options. I wasn't receiving any help from my parents, so I either needed to take out loans, work to earn the remaining amount of money, or be one of the lucky few who gets a scholarship through seemingly random chance. One of the many sick and twisted things about means-tested financial aid is that if I chose to work, I could have actually received less financial aid the next year, as my income would have increased, therefore making the government think, I just didn't need as much. This incentivizes either working an increasing amount every year to make up for the lost aid while also being a full-time student, or to delay paying until after graduation with the help of loans that could crush one in interest and debt if job prospects don't pan out properly. It's a trap that punishes poor students while enriching glorified loan sharks and greedy universities. Scholarships aren't some magical to solution to this problem either, and not just because they're more complicated to obtain than financial aid. In 2019, there were 19.73 million people who attended post-secondary institutions, both public and private. However, only 1.58 million of these individuals received some form of scholarship, which amounts to 8.1% of students. These lucky few who received scholarships were treated to an average of $3,852 per recipient, which is nowhere near enough to make up for the cost not covered by financial aid. The average cost of tuition, fees, room, and board was $30,000, of course varying widely depending on the public-private status of the institution. While I couldn't find a concrete way to determine an average amount of aid received across public and private institutions, I found an estimate from educationdata.org which stated that even with financial aid, 70% of universities are unaffordable for most working class and middle class students. So clearly, means-tested financial aid is not doing enough to make up the gap between rich and the poor. In fact, it's widening the gap, because all these considerations and all this stress simply doesn't matter if someone's family just has enough to pay for their education. Means-tested financial aid is still better than nothing for higher education, as any grad student can attest to, being entirely unable to receive government assistance, but it's still deeply flawed. Proponents of means testing, if they care about these struggles at all, may advocate for some changes such as increasing the amount of aid given, streamlining the application process, or changing some of the conditions under which aid is calculated. These changes, while a potential improvement, would do nothing to address the core problems of means testing, such as disincentivizing financial advancement, or making the application process more inaccessible to the disadvantaged. The only way to actually help those in poverty, and to actually make post-secondary education accessible to all who are academically capable of pursuing it, is to make college universal. The U.S. has the most expensive, yet inefficient, healthcare system in the world. There are many culprits for that, such as capitalist greed, deregulation, and of course, means testing. I've been the recipient of two means-tested healthcare programs throughout my life, CHIP, the Ch Children's Health Insurance Program, until I was 19, and Medicaid, when I was 19 through 21, when I graduated from university and got a full-time job. Medicaid is the term used to describe healthcare assistance for low-income people in the U.S not to be confused with Medicare, which is available to those 65 and up and some children with disabilities. 
CHIP is a branch of Medicaid specifically aimed at children in low-income families and relies on an application to be administered. It differs from state to state, but recipients may still be required to pay premiums and co-pays, although these are capped at no more than 5% of a person's annual income. Medicaid is more typically offered to low-income adults and is largely dictated by the funding of inter individual states. CHIP was pretty good in terms of the choice of providers, but Medicaid for adults is far more restrictive and often demeaning. Most adult Medicaid recipients can't find health care providers outside their home region, and especially their home state, and as a result are subject to exorbitant out-of-network fees if they travel. Many Medicaid programs do not provide comprehensive coverage, and every visit to a medical facility could spell disaster if they choose not to cover something. Aside from the many restrictions, incentives not to improve one's income for fear of becoming ineligible, applications and ongoing reapplications, Medicaid seems okay, as it does help many people access health care they otherwise would not be able to. However, Medicaid and Medicare are often used as excuses to let insurance companies and medical providers run wild with pricing as the government only negotiates or regulates prices within their own programs. Healthcare is a human right, and the circus of insurance, means testing, and ruthless greed need to end. At this point, you may be wondering, how did we end up with so many convoluted, ineffective social programs that have been bogged down and made impotent by means testing? There are a variety of reasons that those in power support means testing, and depending on who you ask, you're likely to get a bunch of different answers. There are some politicians who champion means testing as a way to most effectively help the poor, most often Democrats, members of the Labour Party, and other similar pseudo-left parties in government. They often justify it as a means of gatekeeping those who don't need assistance from benefiting from the same programs as those who do need assistance. They might say, the rich shouldn't be able to send their children to college for free, or able-bodied people shouldn't be able to receive disability benefits and take away from those who need it most. The entire mentality is centered on making social programs exclusive to those who truly need them, either as a moralistic argument against those who unfairly may try to take advantage, or as an argument that such programs are better able to benefit groups who need them the most. In reality, means-tested programs cause the most harm to those who actually need them, for a variety of reasons. There are other politicians who want to use uh, means testing as a way of shaming or punishing those who need assistance. In the U.S., people who receive food stamp assistance are often embarrassed at the checkout line where they have to inform the cashier that they'll be paying using EBT. They're also barred from purchasing hot foods and mocked ruthlessly if they buy anything other than what's considered the bare necessities. With other assistance programs such as WIC, a food assistance program for low-income women, infants, and children, WIC, women, infants, and children, recipients have to navigate a confusing selection of arbitrarily approved foods scattered throughout the store, often having to put some back and hold up the line at checkout. People will often insult, harass, and even make threats towards people who make use of food assistance programs as they consider them to be leeches on their tax money. As was discussed in my prior examples, people are often disincentivized from advancing their financial status due to the possibility of losing their assistance. This is particularly awful with disability benefits, where most recipients have to undergo a years-long evaluation process where they have to subjugate themselves to poverty with an income of no more than $1,300 a month, and have difficulties getting married, which can jeopardize one's benefits, have less than $2,000 worth of assets, including savings and personal possessions, and must undergo invasive medical evaluations with doctors incentivized not to believe them. Government officials and their supporters will justify all this by saying that one must truly be suffering to be worthy of assistance that can alleviate the need to work. Oftentimes, means testing is used purely as a means of cruelty. In the United States, low-income housing, as rare as it is, 
will be purposefully built in undesirable areas, made with lesser quality, and use potentially dangerous materials, all while cost costing almost as much as standard housing. This results in adverse health outcomes, both mentally and physically, which further feeds into the means-tested healthcare and disability systems that we've already discussed. Regardless of the social program, applications often take ages to get processed through a web of inefficient bureaucracy, take even longer to actually start paying out, and are constantly jeopardized by threatened cuts or callous public officials who try to find some reason to take away people's benefits. The government is incentivized to be as restrictive as possible, as they get to limit the budget, use their inefficiency as a scare tactic to try to get people to work harder, and then point to their own failures as a means of justifying further cuts to the ineffective programs. Means testing is a crude, callous tool of oppression from the ruling class. The United States might be particularly egregious with its many means-tested programs, but governments around the world utilize means-testing to the detriment of their citizens. The alternative of making programs universal is often scoffed at by capitalists and their mouthpieces in government and media with fears of high costs and moral decay. However, universal programs have significant merit and should be the ideal of any socialist, anarchist, or other human being with an ounce of empathy. To use one example that I've already discussed, the U.S. government spends an astronomical amount more on health care than other nations, while only covering a fraction of the population and receiving worse outcomes. Universal health care would be cheaper, cover everyone, and promote greater outcomes due to the lack of incentive for exploitation. I'll include a link uh, to a video in the sources that does a much more exhaustive job of explaining how this is possible, but the general premise is Cutting out bureaucratic waste, setting reasonable prices in place of corporate extortion, and reallocating funds from executive pay, administrative overhead, and raw profit back into services and savings. The same can be applied to other social programs as well. Universal food security would eliminate hunger and pay for itself with the reduced medical costs associated with eliminating malnutrition and its adverse effects. Universal housing would eliminate homelessness and harmful transients and has already been found to be a highly cost-effective uh, means uh, in comparison to ceaselessly fighting homelessness with police brutality and other cruelty. Universal education for people of all ages would lead to a more educated, innovative, and productive society. And as a side note, it's baffling to me how most people haven't figured out that having more Doctors, teachers, engineers, and other positions typically barred behind expensive higher education would be a good thing. Proper universal basic income would free people from the burden of compulsory work and incentivize the rise of healthy automation for menial tasks, freeing up the masses to pursue their intrinsic passions. People would no longer be disincentivized from advancing themselves for fear of losing their assistance, as it would be guaranteed regardless. If people still wanted to sell their labor or participate in a cooperative or something, they could in a truly voluntary fashion, and likely for much higher wages to make it worth their while. Universal programs are not utopian. They're just the most efficient means of distributing resources. They're still bound to the laws of nature, like supply, distribution, organization, and so on. There will still be many challenges, but it's worth it for the many benefits it would bring to society. And all of this is still possible without the unaccountable central institution known as the state. If anything, this is likely only possible with the abolition of the state, which has fought tooth and nail against universal social programs, which would spell the end for capitalist exploitation. Social programs have historically been used under capitalism as a safety net, meant to stop society from collapsing and to keep the masses content. In the United States, the government has been testing just how far they can push people into suffering and despair without them revolting. And we've begun to see people fight back with increasingly frequent and massive protests. Means testing is one of the many weapons used by these tyrants to make life needlessly hard for the masses. And it's time we relegated its use to history. 
We can take small steps now by pointing out the absurdities and contradictions of means testing, hoping to promote temporary change by spreading awareness. But ultimately, we need to build a social framework capable of tolerating and promoting universal social programs. Thanks.